Good morning. I'm Mike Nelson. I'm a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And today we're going to spend an hour previewing a new book by Anu Bradford. She is a professor of law and international organization at the Columbia School of Law. She's also the director of the European Legal Studies Center at Columbia Law School. And most importantly for us, she's a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And we're here to talk about a brand new book that is not yet out in the bookstores, but will be in just about four weeks. It's a, uh, and a follow on and an expansion of her very successful and provocative book, The Brussels Effect, looking at how the European Union has shaped policy for technology, emerging technologies, not only in Europe, but throughout the world. Um, and in this new book, she's not only looking at the role of European countries and the European Union, she's also looking at the American model, which is, of course, much more laissez-faire and disorganized, and the Chinese model of internet governance and digital policy. It's an incredibly ambitious book. It's one that I wish had been written at least 10 years ago. I was a professor of internet studies at Georgetown University at the time, and I taught a class on what's shaping the internet. And back then there were only about three books on this topic, and each one had its limitations. One was Laura Denardis's book on the global war for internet governance. Another was called who rules the net, and another one was called Who Governs the Net. And then there were some very useful primers from the Diplo Foundation. But this book is both more ambitious, more current, and I think more provocative than those others. Those were more academic studies. This book is a something that I think will shape policy, help educate journalists, and I hope will be read by by uh, CEOs and legal counsels, not only at tech companies, but at uh, other companies outside the tech sector, which are often tech companies, whether they know it or not. But I'm gonna ask a few opening questions, and then we're going to have time for Q&A. Uh, some of our Carnegie scholars are on the line and they'll have some questions. But let me start Anu, by asking you to dig in a little bit. We've got these three models. Clearly in each country, there's a lot of variation within the, uh, when it comes to policy making. Here in the United States, we have national government, we have state government, and we have changes in administration. But there are core fundamentals that set the US model apart from the European model, apart from the Chinese model. So if you could just quickly give us the precy for the people who have not read the book yet. What is the, what, what are the fundamental bullet points under each model? Great. So first of all, thank you, Mike, so much for having me here. And thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm really looking forward to sharing this conversation. So the three models hopefully will help us analytically structure the different ways we can think about digital governance. So I distinguish across three digital empires, the leading digital powers, the United States, China, and the EU, whose respective regulatory models to me are the primary sort of three distinct ways that we can think about the relationship between the state, the, the market, and the individuals. So if we start from the United States model, I call that a market-driven model. It is the model that really centers on free speech, the free internet and incentives to innovate. It places its trust often in self-governance by tech companies and reserves only a limited role for the government. So it is an inherently techno-optimistic vision for how internet and the technologies ought to be governed. So the Chinese model differentiates itself by being what I call distinctly state-driven. So the main goal for the Chinese government is to make China a technological superpower. But in addition, the Chinese government wants to leverage technology to entrench the power of the Chinese Communist Party by using technology towards surveillance, censorship, and propaganda. So also the internet is a, a tool for political control 
And then the European model. There's often this perception in the public conversation that, that we have two models. There's a Chinese internet and an American internet. And the, U, the European Union, the rest, is just forced to choose between the two. So the book argues that the EU is not forced to, nor willing to, nor capable of choosing between the market-driven model or the state-driven model. Instead, it has its own distinct vision, a third path on how to govern the digital economy. And that is for like what I call a rights-driven regulatory model. So it reflects the EU's very human-centric vision for the digital economy, where the protection of the fundamental rights of individuals, the preservation of democratic structures of the society, and then also a, a more equitable distribution of the gains from digital economy is very central. And there's also this belief that we cannot see it this stage to the tech companies. Instead, we need to root, we need to entrench this governance into rule of law and subject it to oversight by democratic institutions. And that makes it also different from when, it, when we think about, yes, the US is also a believer in democracy. The US is also a believer in fundamental rights. But there's a distinction in the US believing how do we realize those gains for democracy and fundamental rights? Do we really trust the tech companies to look out for those rights? Or do we need the governments to intervene? So Mike, those are in the broad uh, overview of the three digital models, fully knowing there's world outside of these three, uh, three digital powers as well. But let me add just one thing why I call the book Digital Empires. And here the idea is that none of these three models are confined to the boundaries of each jurisdiction. But instead, we see the US and China and the EU export their regulatory models. So we see the presence of these models interact and intersect in third countries as well. Thank you. That, that, was, that was almost Twitter-esque. Mm -hmm. Just the bullet points. That was great. Uh, I do a lot of work with Carnegie India, and they have mm -hmm. a global summit every year in December looking at technology. And I think India is going to be in many ways yeah a force that pushes the other models in different directions than they might want to otherwise. And they are in some cases taking the best and the worst mm -hmm. from each of the other three models. You're, I said at the start that your book was incredibly ambitious. It not only outlines these three models, it examines the interplay between each model, how, how the US and the European models intersect, collide, uh, some case coalesce into something better, how the two other models work with the Chinese model. Uh, the, the Chinese can't set up their own internet. They wanna be part of the global economy. So I, I found that section of the book uh, incredibly useful. I, I, 30 years ago, I was in the Clinton White House and I got to fly to the European Union headquarters with Al Gore to meet with Martin Bongaman, who at the time was the commissioner for industrial relations and digital technology. And even then, 30 years ago, there was this clear difference in culture. I, I, I wouldn't say it's a difference in goal. I mean, the, the priorities were a little different, but it was really the culture. In the U.S., particularly in the Clinton administration, our motto was first do no harm. Here was this emerging technology. At that point, the, the web had just been commercialized. There were about 6,000 websites. But there was already a sense that this is going to be game changing if we don't screw it up. And there was also a sense in, Br in Brussels, and, and Bongaman was sort of the epitome of this. Their motto was prevent all possible harm. And it was, it was really striking to see in the conversations between the leaders how the US would come in and say optimistically, yeah, things are going to go wrong, but we have this great technology, we'll fix it. And then the other side basically saying, well, it, we're going to get blamed if something bad happens. So don't let anything bad happen. Now, in the end, the two sides came to a pretty good consensus. And, and the Europeans uh, bought into what we called the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, in preparation for this, I, I sent questions to some of the people I know best who have been doing internet governance for the longest time. And two of them were uh, Meilin Fang, who has been working with Vint Cerf, one of the two fathers of the internet, on something called the people-centered internet. And they work with governments around the world to 
figure out how we can all benefit from the internet and how we can empower the users, not the governments, not the corporations. Uh, and, and obviously, some cases we've done the right thing and people have the tools to do incredible work, but that, that isn't always the case. But one of the reasons I think the internet has evolved so quickly and has developed so many applications is because we have had a multi-stakeholder approach. We haven't put the government in charge. We haven't put the, the corporations in charge. Uh, and we have a lot of civil society groups that speak out on how the internet should develop and individual users. Every day, billions of users make billions of choices about what they're going to do online. And that affects how the internet evolves. So my, my question is, how do we maintain this inclusive, broad participation in the decision making of the internet? How do we avoid having one or two choke points that get to decide what the internet's going to be? I, I'm very concerned, right, very specifically, that the United Nations, just in the last six months, has stopped saying multi-stakeholder, multi-stakeholder, multi-stakeholder. That used to be the mantra. Uh, now they're saying multilateral. And a lot of countries are very happy with that because they think that governments should be in charge. The UN will still acknowledge that there are other players and that governments should talk to civil society groups and the corporations and the technologists who make it all work. But the trend's in the opposite direction. The trend is towards concentration. And in your book, you mentioned how the Freedom House has documented how governments are taking control of the internet to censor it, to lock it down, and to prevent dissidents and reporters from using it. So that's a very long-winded question about a very hard topic that's been debated for 30 years. So. Multi-stakeholder, multilateral, does it matter? Yeah, so I think it does matter. And I don't think there's a very simple answer to that. And I think we see maybe trends in both directions. So I think you're absolutely right that we see the states now being back in. There's a couple of reasons for that. So one is that I think we as a whole, like societies in general, have now less faith in tech companies. The tech companies don't have the track record that left to their own devices, they are governing the internet and the digital economy in the ways that preserves public interest and then preserves the democratic structures of the society. So even the United States is now having second thoughts of the techno-libertarian foundations of the US model. It is fully aware that the economy has become too concentrated and then we are in the situations where individuals are often stripped of their personal privacy, dignity, and surrounded by disinformation and hate speech. So it is no surprise that we have a backlash to this American free market model. So that is partially driving the European Union and others attempts now to rein in the tech companies and bring the state more forcefully in. But one could also say that it is not even the United States that is anymore playing a very market-driven game. It is playing often the be like Beijing game. So if you look at the extent to which the U.S. is now pursuing export controls, investment restrictions, the attempts to ban TikTok uh, in, in the U.S., it is moving also towards the state-driven model in many ways, and the entire world risks becoming somewhat more techno-nationalist and techno-protectionist, which is a reflection of the heightened geopolitical tensions, the um, lack of faith in international institutions and international cooperation, the lack of trust that has been the foundation of those governance models. So I think that's one, one driver. Um, and, and that may be part of, to some extent, the, the, the change in the rhetoric, the discussion about multilateral governance. And this is what China and Russia and the others have been pushing for a long while. They have attacked this multi-stakeholder model because it was reflecting, in their view, too much of American interest and tech companies' interest. And they wanted to bring the state in. But there's a couple of ways to bring the state in. There's the authoritarian way to bring the state in. And then there is the more the European, more techno-democratic way to still recognize that we cannot trust the tech companies. We need the states to be there. But that is also a rejection of the authoritarian model. But let me, because of the complexity of the question, uh, might mention another other sort of counter-argument to the, the world that you were describing. 
There's also a serious conversation uh, by those who say that the states are simply incapable of governing the digital economy anymore. So Ian Bremer talks about we don't live in a bipolar world or multipolar world. We live in a technopolar world. And if you look at the attempts by the United States to legislate, it is a very thin record what we are seeing. And then the attempts of the European Union, they can plenty legislate, but the difficulties of actually entrenching those regulations into concrete market outcomes where the state would be effectively controlling the tech companies. Many say that that leaves a lot to be desired. So I think there is, and this is what the digital empires also focuses on, not only the horizontal battle between the three leading digital empires, but also the vertical battle between the governments and the companies asking the question whether the true empires are actually the companies because the states don't find a way to effectively regulate. I was going to ask you about Ian Bremmer's thesis, and, and, and particularly there, there, there really should be two different versions of it. One is the tech monopolies take control, and that clearly is the big fear in, in Brussels. But the other is that these little startups just go out there and keep changing the world. Some of them grow into tech titans in a few years, until they're knocked off, or at least until they're joined by other startups who have grown. I mean, what OpenAI has done, uh, coming out of nowhere, yeah. with the help of $10 billion from Microsoft, uh, is, is also game changing. And I, I think that's one thing that some of us policy wonks don't say often enough. Uh, you can change the world with a law or a regulation or a procurement contract. But three people can build an app that can be downloaded 100 million times in three months and the whole world will be talking about it. This has happened with generative AI just in the last six months. The European Union was all set to regulate artificial intelligence. It had the AI Act drafted. It was well along. And then here was this chat GPT and BARD and these technologies that hadn't been anticipated. They didn't have to go back to the drawing board, but... They had to rethink. Mm -hmm. And and one of my colleagues, uh, Steve Feldstein, has asked a question regarding uh, AI and particularly generative AI, which harnesses the power of, of not big data, but huge, humongous data. How, how do you think this could change things? In particular, how do you think the three different models will deal with the data policy questions and the other questions about how we restrict inappropriate uses of AI. So I think it's really interesting that generative AI and the, the release of the chat GPT um, really became a reality when the book went to print. So I didn't discuss it at length, but the, the analytical framework and the three models actually explain exactly what we are seeing right now, which is really interesting. So the US is still very true to its market-driven instincts. So there's only voluntary guidance that is now emerging. We've got blueprints. We have conversations with leading tech companies and the White House. We have the word of these tech companies that we've got this. We are going to govern responsibly. We care about uh, transparency. But there is this fundamental American faith that, look, we do not want to curtail this tremendous economic opportunity. We are regulating in the shadow of US-China tech war, and we need to worry about innovation. So we have seen some serious concerns expressed by the public, by lawmakers, even by tech companies themselves, the developers of AI, warning about the harms embedded in these models. But we are thus far seeing no effort to legislate in the US the way, US, the, the, way the EU and China are charging ahead by regulating. And the EU, as expected, with its, like you said in the beginning, that we want to make sure that there are no harms and we are ahead of the game and prevent those harms from materializing. The EU is at the final stages of adopting a comprehensive horizontal AI act and generative AI will be included. That was somewhat of a last minute addition, 
but that is still going to be part of the EU's rights-driven regulatory framework. And there is a lot of concerns about innovation and making sure that we do not curtail that, but at the same time, a concern about large-scale surveillance, discrimination, what happens to democracy if, if AI distorts our sense of reality. So there is the European rights-driven model that is now leading the way when and how we regulate generative AI. China as well has been very proactive. So there has been ambitious efforts to regulate AI by China. And AI is interesting for, for China because if you think about AI, including then facial recognition and surveillance technologies can really advance the goals of the Communist Party. But then generative AI can also undermine some of that control if we fail to mitigate the kind of censorship requirement that need to be in place in order to, uh, to, to control the narratives online. So that's why we see the Chinese government also then pursue its own more political control-driven model in regulating the, the generative AI. And then uh, we need to ensure then that the kind of content that is used to train these models is still in line with the rhetoric that is acceptable to the Communist Party. So yes, it can be a game changer. No, it doesn't fundamentally change the way the three powers are looking at the governing the technology. Well, uh, perhaps you and I should write a point counterpoint on whether the, EU, the EU AI Act as currently drafted is a good thing. Uh, I just find it astonishing that they think that they're going to write regulations that control the algorithms at the core of these programs. I, I think it's great that they're looking at how the systems could be abused. But for the most part, we have lots of laws on how to make sure computer programs are not abused. You know, whether it's in banking or in fraud, I mean, I, I, I get very upset when I see laws that say, and your algorithm will do this and this and this and this, when the algorithms for artificial intelligence rewrite themselves every, every month or every week or every day or every hour as you feed it more data. It's, it's as you were saying, that there, there, there's a lot of questions about what can be regulated and what should be regulated. And, uh, how to do this right. But anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's another, another project for both you no, and- Mike, let, let me uh, quickly weigh in on that because I think we are in full agreement that this is not an easy thing to regulate. The question is that whether after acknowledging that you arrived at the conclusion that the lawmakers then should stay out and we leave this for tech companies, then there I am, I am willing to defend that the lawmakers need to have their seat at the table, even if it's hard thing. We have lawmakers regulate a lot of hard things. They regulate aviation safety without knowing how to build planes. They regulate pharmaceuticals. And they, at the same time, do not have the understanding on how to develop, for instance, these medicines. And it's often said that the lawmakers don't understand technology. So they, they should not be regulating, for instance, AI. But AI is not just about technology. It's also how this technology implicates democracy, how it implicates fundamental rights. And I wouldn't say that the, the meta and the other actors like that in the world are experts in democracy that have the track record of protecting our fundamental rights and that would have any competence then to be left to their own devices uh, with this technology. So I think that the, the, the only feasible way to get this right is that we do need to have a very close collaboration between the governments that ultimately in charge of, of democratic oversight, but also working closely with the tech companies, because I would like to think that their interests are or can be aligned. The tech companies don't want the technologies to be deployed as a sort of massive tools of fraud and criminal activity. And, and we also need the public to trust these technologies. So if we can create the regulatory frameworks that fosters that trust, that fosters the kind of responsible environment within which we develop these technologies, I'm optimistic that it is a better state of the world, despite the, the well understood and serious difficulties of always getting the regulation absolutely right. So maybe we don't write a point counterpoint. We write a point point yeah. and focus on those things that the lawmakers should be focusing on. And, and that's what I'm most upset about yeah. is I, I worked with politicians in the Congress, at the White House. And if you do your homework, you can figure out what the real problem is and what levers you have to pull. Uh, you mentioned the U.S. government being unlikely to pass an A.I regulation 
package. Uh, I think that's right. And, and I hope they don't. I hope they instead focus on privacy, which we need to focus on, focus on data quality, focus on encryption. There's a whole bunch of issues that if we do those right, AI will be a very powerful and successful new technology. But it's, it's funny. It's, it's almost as if they're being distracted on purpose. I mean, some of the discussion about the end of the world and how AI is going to destroy our civilization is a great way to get politicians to stop focusing on the things that we already know are problems and, and could be fixed with mm -hmm. some, some useful uh, requirements of transparency, some useful uh, updates of law on fraud or advertising or consumer protection. Let me go back to the questions. We're getting quite a few here. Uh, another one from Steve is something we, we touched on just briefly, and that was the, the, the role of the other countries. And uh, the, the, right in a few days, the G20 are going to be meeting. It's chaired by India this year, and uh, Prime Minister Modi has made it very clear that he wants to lead on some digital issues. So if you were a G20 nation mm -hmm. and not the U.S., or a European country, uh, or China, what would you do at the G20? What would you What would you do to kind of push these three empires in a direction that will help you? If you're India, if you're Brazil, um, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, there, there's a number of countries there that are not seen as tech powerhouses, but they're certainly going to be uh, impacted by all the discussions around digital policy. Yeah. So in many ways, I, I call these, uh, it's a great question, Steve, by the way, and I call these uh, states like India and Brazil swing states or the battleground states, extremely important markets where we don't necessarily see a full alignment with one existing digital empire. So this is not like in the Cold War where the world was pretty neatly divided in the capitalist and communist uh, world. There's a, there's a many... Uh, swing states that are likely to be influenced by several empires. So you can see this overlap in influence. They may have American tech companies, Chinese digital infrastructure, and the emulation of European rules to govern those tech companies and that infrastructure. So, and we, we see China in particular have been very successful in expanding its digital empire through the digital Silk Road, the infrastructures that it has been building across Africa, Latin America, Asia, even parts of Europe. So in many of these uh, uh, battleground states, they welcome the Chinese digital infrastructure. It is good quality, it's affordable, and it is their path to digital development. So even if the U.S. was trying to persuade these countries to reject the Chinese digital infrastructure, many of these countries have been rebutting the U.S. warnings and basically saying that, look, we can't afford to care about digital surveillance. We need a path to development. And without the U.S. providing an alternative, it is very hard to expect these other countries then to say no to Chinese digital infrastructure. So these countries can also push back on the, the digital empire. So they could say no to Chinese digital infrastructures, but they do need to have an alternative. And many are not yet in the position to provide all these infrastructures, data centers, undersea cables, surveillance technologies themselves. They are getting them from somewhere. They can also emulate a variant of the European model that does seek to then rein in the American tech giant's power. So that is one way to reject the reach or redraw the boundaries of the American digital empire. So that's one thing that these states can be doing. And I think what we are seeing, we don't see this full alignment or absolute loyalty or the willingness to go behind uh, the U.S. in its efforts to, to, to fight a, a tech war with China and persuade the rest of the, the, the world to align with the U.S. policies. So in many ways, these countries show that they have their independent set of interests and, and they cannot be dictated necessarily on, on how uh, they govern their digital economies. Instead, they are taking pieces uh, from the different models uh, while also looking with what, what, is, what best, best serves their economies and, and societies. But we are seeing, Mike, kind of a move loosely towards a bipolar world where there is a set of authoritarian countries lining up behind a variant of the Chinese state-driven model. 
And we see a lot of democratic countries then coalescing behind a variant of the European rights-driven model. We don't see a lot of takers for the market-driven model. That's, I mean, one of the conclusions of the book that we do see a fall of the American digital empire. Even the U.S. itself, it's losing its faith in, it, in its empire uh, and in that, that rests on these market-driven uh, principles. Um, but yes, these other countries are absolutely key. And the ones that Steve mentions there, uh, India, Brazil, they are the ones that we are very much watching. I, I hope... I hope that those players at the G20 are, are, are informed enough and effective enough politically to, to push in the right direction. I, I have a very simple answer to my own question. Um, Steve wrote this book, The Rise of Digital Repression, How Technology is Reshaping Power, Politics and Resistance. And my recommendation is that every country uh, represented at the G20 read that book. Uh, unfortunately, a few of them are going to read the book and think it's a, a, a business plan. They're going to use it as a blueprint for repressing their own people. But I hope most of them will read it and say, this is what we've got to avoid. And they'll take action to make sure we don't have surveillance built into every aspect of the Internet. Uh, another question coming from the audience is about the evolution of power in the digital era. And, and this, is, this is a question I'd like because it's about wording. I mean, you, you've been incredibly successful with the buzzword Brussels effect. And we've got a lot of people using that and helping understand, helping others understand what's going on in Europe and, and the very important role that's being played. But the, this, this questioner asks how we should think about this digital power. You know, we've got hard power, the military. We've got soft power, which has been around a long time from televisions and newspapers. We've got smart power. Uh, we've got sharp power, which means lots of different things. Do you have a buzzword that should be used to explain how governments can exert their will? Because uh, it, it, it is different. It's not, it's, it, we, we, and don't say cyber power because that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> no, I think, Mike, it's, it's true that power is, comes in many forms. And, and power is not fully interchangeable. So you may have a lot of hard power, but you don't have soft power. Soft power cannot always be converted into hard power. There are different periods of time when certain powers are particularly salient. Like in today's more tense geopolitical environment, we obviously do worry more about hard power. When we discuss AI, we do think about military geopolitical applications of AI because that is unfortunately the state of the world where we live in. I use the word power in digital empires also when I describe the different facets of power that are deployed by each of the three empires. So they are exporting their models, resorting to a different source of power, depending what their comparative advantage is. So the U.S. is really exporting the private power of its tech companies, whereas China is exporting the infrastructure power. And through these networks, then basically expanding the surveillance network and the Chinese influence over technology standards. And the EU is exporting the power that I have written about before, the Brussels effect, the EU's regulatory power. That is the power that the EU has, that is very comfortable using, and where it sees the greatest results, given what its limitations and what its uh, advantages are. So those are the three dimensions of power that take a center st a stage in digital empires. It's not an exhaustive way to think about different other facets of power. It's not a book that much on hard power. There are books that really are about military conflict, but it's really about the, how regulation as such shapes the economic, uh, uh, the, the sort of the, the digital economy, the digital society, but it is um, a, uh, the power is very central and it's used in different ways by each of the three empires. Thank you. The, the other buzzword that I'm hearing and, it, and it's a very poorly defined buzzword, and that is Brussels defect. Mm -hmm. And so the question is whether the Brussels effect, which clearly is a thing and has existed and has been successful, is becoming a Brussels defect. And different critics use different explanations. But if I were to criticize what Brussels is doing, the biggest problem I have 
And it's one we have in California, too. As you know, California adopted a version of the GDPR at the urging of people in Brussels. And they did exactly the same thing that the European Parliament did, is they passed this legislation, and it was a pretty carefully scripted, crafted draft that tried to balance the different needs. But when the parliamentarians got to it, and when the California legislature got to it, they just decided to add a lot of new things. Uh, in your book, you mentioned that there were 4,000 different amendments to the uh, general data protection regulation. And the result was that these incompatible amendments were put into the code. And so companies were being told to do two or three things at the same time when these goals were colliding. I mean, a good example right now is with artificial intelligence. We have people who stand up and say, we want to know exactly what kind of data you're using. We have to be able to see the training data that goes into your computer models. And then they turn around and then and the next amendment says, oh, but make sure that nobody can find out what personal data is going into your models. These are two good goals, you know, transparency and privacy and they're colliding and, and I see this over and over in digital policy I see it in encryption is another area where we have the FBI the intelligence agencies saying let's have a back door for encryption you know we, we we want encryption that only the good guys can use and then we have the cybersecurity community saying if you don't have good encryption everywhere the bad guys are going to figure out how to use the back door. And again, colliding policies. Am I right here? Is there is there any way that Brussels or the U.S. is going to actually find consensus recommendations that don't tell companies to do three things when they can only do one of them? So, Mike, I think it's absolutely right that uh, that criticism is often well placed. So one criticism that I, I discuss in the book, for instance, the unintended um, side effect, if you like, of the GDPR was that it has entrenched the power of the big tech companies, that often they are the ones that can afford to comply with the exacting privacy standards of the EU. So that directly undermines the EU's goals on fairness and redistribution and trying to uh, shift the power away from big tech, big tech companies to the smaller players. So I think that just there are many examples of how there are hard trade-offs and sometimes the policy goals are not fully compatible. And I think they are often at full display in digital economy, but they are not certainly limited to digital economy. I think there are many different domains of policy making where we're trying to make sense of the complex world and regulate complex world. And sometimes you, you do end up having policy goals that are harder to reconcile. And I think our job as policy analysts, as academics, is to point out those inconsistencies and then make sure that we would see an improvement as the legislative process continues. So that particular example of the EU disproportionately burdening the smaller companies with the GDPR is now taken into account in the EU's newest uh, regulatory achievements, if you like, the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, which are distinctly asymmetrical really only targeting the big companies, that's the DMA. And also the DSA imposes relatively greater obligations for these very large online platforms. So I don't think we can always fully reconcile them, but we certainly see sometimes that the legislators themselves recognize the limitations of them, sometimes retroactively when they realize how these regulations actually operate in the marketplace. But it's also very complicated when we are trying to uh, legislate in democracies with very complicated set of interests. So in the EU, you have 27 different member states, you have three different institutions, and they have a sort of somewhat different hierarchy of concerns, all of which would be valid. So yes, we want to protect the fundamental right to privacy. Yes, we actually do realize that some degree of surveillance is important and in public interest. And how do we then reconcile those? And every institution, every member state doesn't really set those trade-offs exactly the same way. And that sometimes results then 
in, in the legislation that is framed in a way that can be hard for corporations to navigate. I fully, fully agree with that, Mike. The other challenge at the European Union is that they don't do national security. I mean, that's the jurisdiction of the individual nation states. Yeah. Um, and so that makes it hard to incorporate all the interests of each government mm -hmm. in the discussion. But um, yeah, I, it's, I don't know who's more chaotic and challenged, the U.S. Congress or uh, the European Union. Oh, I think I have a view on that, <laughs> Mike. So I think the EU has uh, a lot that we can criticize, but I think it's really hard for me to defend the legislative record of the American Congress when it comes to digital economy. The challenges are probably, if you think of the different parts of the, 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 the supply chain of legislation, yep. and uh, sometimes we may have uh, the EU being less challenged in getting the political consensus to actually promulgating legislation legislation, but then comes the implementation and enforcement where we see much scope for improvement. But mm -hmm. that's why we often get the legislation gets stalled very early on in yeah. US Congress. So we see a lot of effort, a lot of debates, but thus far we see a very thin track record from the US. Well, over the last eight years, we've had three different administrations. The House and the Senate have changed parties. I mean, it's as I said, chaotic is a good good word. Another question we have from the audience, maybe the hardest question of the day. It's one that you address in part in the book. Does your work allow any preliminary insights into how these three approaches might affect future outcomes? Uh, and particularly free speech, disinformation, and consumer protection? So um, I offer some, whether maybe prediction is a strong word, but scenarios and try to explain the different pathways and the relative likelihood. And I think there is one uh, prediction that I make is that there seems to be a growing consensus that this market driven self governance model has outlived its, its usefulness. So we no longer can trust the tech companies uh, with issues like disinformation and maybe free speech. The US has gotten more than it bargained for with Section 230. It has really challenged the democratic structures in the United States itself, while often causing havoc around the world. So there is this consensus that, that, that maybe the U.S. model is not optimal. But how to fix it is not that easy, because it seems like while the U.S. itself would have lost its faith in tech companies, it doesn't really trust the governments in moderating that speech either. And it doesn't, doesn't really trust, this is something that Emily Bazelon said once, that the U.S. model is very hard to fix because you don't want tech companies to be in charge, you don't want governments to be in charge, and you don't want nobody to be in charge. So that doesn't really convert easily into a, a sort of path forward on how to, how to address uh, the challenge that we are facing. But I think one big challenge is that, that we do have the, the challenge for the Europeans to show that, yes, they seem to now have shown with every privacy scandal or disinformation scandal, its model gets vindicated. It can say that, look, the European model best enhances public interest, checks corporate power, and preserves the democratic structures of the society. But if that model cannot fully be implemented, in practice, it is the market-driven model that prevails. And this is something, Mike, that worries me a great deal, is that if we think about that vertical battle between governments and tech companies, and we are often now asking the questions, can the governments really regulate tech companies? I think the question probably needs to be asked, can democratic governments regulate tech companies? Mm -hmm. China can legislate. All that dysfunction that we talked about with the US Congress not being able to pass on legislation, China can pass on legislation. China can enforce legislation. It, the Chinese government doesn't get drawn into these year -long, uh, years long legislative or regulatory or judicial battles with tech companies. So if that is what we are observing, it seems to be that authoritarian countries are able to regulate the digital economy, whereas the democratic government seems to be failing in that same endeavor. And if that is right, we are either governed by the authoritarians or the tech companies. So the real digital empires are the authoritarians, are the tech companies. And that is a very unsettling conclusion for anybody who believes in liberal democracy as a foundation of our society. 
So I think that's one sort of the biggest conclusions that I draw in the end that really gives me pause that we need to, we cannot just in abstract sell democratic governance. We need to show the usefulness and the effectiveness of that model. I, I still am the radical technology optimist who believes that if the technology is developed the right way and the legislation doesn't constrain how we use it, we could end up with an internet where the people have the power. Uh, my, my mantra has always been, the beauty of the internet is that nobody's in charge and that everyone is in charge. Mm -hmm. But it's because we're all making little decisions every day, both in the market and in the political realm. I mean, the politicians are setting policy in response to our votes if the voters are educated and aware of what's going on. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm still one of those cyber libertarian optimists from the early ages. Another question here is uh, from your predictions chapter, and, and that was the part that I found most interesting as a, as a futurist, uh, and I'll probably cite more than any other part of the book. The question is, when it comes to the Chinese vision versus the Russian vision versus the U.S. vision versus the European vision, and, and realizing that each country is going to regulate its sphere separately, uh, aren't, aren't we going to end up with splinternet? That's another buzzword that's gotten a lot mm -hmm. of attention. Aren't we going to see digital borders and uh, the end of applications that work everywhere? So I think in, in many ways, we already see a variant of a splinternet. We already see how China has, with its digital uh, uh, policies, fenced off the Chinese market from many U.S. providers. So the U.S. tech companies, Google, uh, uh, and then Meta's Facebook, other applications are elsewhere. OpenAI, they are not in China. So yes, we already see successful efforts by set borders uh, within the digital uh, economy. But I think one... Um, sort of claim that the book makes that we don't see these binary conclusions necessarily. We are not going to live in the world of free global internet, nor are we going to see a full splinternet. So we are, we see forces of restraint that push us towards sort of continuing cooperation, continuing maintenance of a variant of a global internet and globalized digital economy. It is too costly, if even possible, to completely fence off our, uh, our societies according to our, our national borders and balkanize the digital economy in any complete way. But at the same time, we see constant policy efforts to set those fences and restrict the kind of technological development and globalization that we would see absent those restrictions. So in many ways, we are in this odd world as Mark Leonard wrote this book, The Age of Unpeace, and I think we are seeing the, the kind of unpeace, not full peace, but not full blown war. But we are in this uncomfortable coexistence where there are enough economic pressures that, that, that keeps the certain degree of digital economic engagement ongoing um, and, and prevents the most disruptive full uh, uh, fledged decoupling uh, from, from uh, emerging. But at the same time, I think that battle is the one that will continue to see how much are we pushing towards the different directions without us arriving in the extreme version of either. In your book, you mention a long list of groups that are standing up and saying, we'll figure this out. We'll do digital policy. The UN calls it digital cooperation. There's a number of groups that are focused just on artificial intelligence and the threats of uh, robot overlords. Um, I didn't ask you this ahead of time and I have, and maybe it's a completely unfair question, but there are all these different groups and within the OECD, there's groups and the WTO and the ITU and the UN. And, uh, and one questioner says, you know, I think we need a UN China convention on artificial general intelligence, uh, some or an e even a, a UN agency. So my question is, if all of these different groups called you up and said, we want you to lead our effort, which one you, would you say yes to? Or would you go back, would you say no to all of them? Is there any group out there that really has you excited and, and you think has the right tools and the right people and the right levers to make a difference? <laughs> 
So I'm a believer in a multilateral world and the world of cooperation. And I think that these governance issues are such that would be best in the first best world would be addressed jointly. I don't believe even the EU, I've written about the EU's unilateral regulatory power, but I've always said that the EU itself is a function of multinationalism. Its first preference is to do things jointly with the rest of the world. But I'm also realistic that we don't see that the, the multilateral system working particularly well. We don't see effective international governance. And I think it would be then naive, even reckless, to leave it for these institutions that are not necessarily capable of producing effective governance to say that, OK, we, we cannot do this as, as individual nations or working bilaterally because we are going to trust in the UN for doing that. So China and Russia, for instance, have tried to vest the UN with more powers over Internet governance in part because that would then take the power back to the states. And they could also exert more influence in a setting like the UN compared to more kind of a standard setting, multi-stakeholder organizations that the US and the EU have, have preferred. I do think that there's value, for instance, in the Trade and Technology Council, where the US and the EU are trying to align their uh, positions. There's often a trade of the, the broader the group within which you are trying to seek consensus. Often you are pushed more towards the lowest common denominator, more watered down rules. And, and I think it's just fair to say that even if it comes to these efforts now to have global compact of some kind on AI governance, uh, China is pretty far apart in its views from the US and the EU, for instance, that it's hard to think about having a binding, effective, ambitious, truly global governance instrument from emerging. That doesn't mean, Mike, though, that I, I wouldn't like to see those conversations taking place at least even if we have different fora for dialogue and engagement, I think it can help us manage some of the disruptions that are still inevitable in the absence of a truly global combat. Well, I'm a physicist who spent most of my career hanging out with engineers, particularly network engineers, and their whole focus is interoperability. So if we don't have one policy global, perhaps we at least get interoperable systems that can have interfaces between them. They can both coexist and work successfully. Uh, a related question to where is the power, where is the ability to coordinate, is who, who, which world leaders do you think are providing leadership here? Um, I've worked with a lot of global leaders over the years. Uh, I've been impressed with Thomas Ilvis in Estonia, uh, the former prime minister of, of New Zealand, took a real leadership role on content moderation. Is there any president, prime minister, chancellor, king, uh, queen in office today that you think really understands and is, is showing a way to a better digital future? I, emperor, I guess we need emperors too. <laughs> So I think it's very different, the dynamics on how authoritarian in authoritarian countries, the leaders can set policies uh, is very different from being a leader in a democratic country or democratic union like the EU. And the question is, it is less clear that there can be a single leader who could then effectively represent the diverse interests necessarily uh, across the EU. So it's hard for me to say who would be the, the, the true leader and exemplary uh, leader in terms of setting the, the digital uh, policies there. I, I would note, though, that, for instance, um, President Biden, uh, through various statements, efforts, the nominations, uh, who heads the agencies, has shown that he wants to lead the shift in how the U.S. views digital uh, uh, regulation. So there certainly is a shift that is a, a rather palpable in this uh, particular administration. But for instance, that has not moved our Congress. So we still have separation of powers. So that I think is the one way to say that you could be a leader with a very strong vision of taking your country to a different direction. But it's very hard for you to then institutionalize that uh, vision if you are not a dictator and you work with other centers of power within the countries. But I do want to go back to what you said that, that ultimately, the way you govern digital economy, I, I wouldn't just like to look at the, the leaders. I really would want it to be the kind of process where we are engaging 
different stakeholders, civil society. We are trying to empower users of technology. Ultimately, it needs to be a way forward for digital society that delivers peace and prosperity in a way that serves societies at large. And, and that is something that the, the trend, tremendous potential of AI revolution, for instance, is then engineered towards uh, a, a set of values that are then a, a function of what in the democratic debate we, we can, uh, as the division that emerges from a more democratic debate of what do we want the technology to do to so serve our society as well. So I guess I look less as a characteristic of an individual leader or can single out somebody, but rather societies that can really conduct the debates in ways that are productive, that are inclusive, and that then can ultimately then uh, lead to a better vision and outcomes. That was an incredibly diplomatic answer. And uh, I will be diplomatic and not ask the second part of the question, which is, which world leader do you think is doing the most damage to our digital future? But we can talk about that offline. So the, the last question I'll go to is from the audience. And it's about how do we build bridges between government and business that are as effective as they were in the 90s? In the 90s, there was a sense among the entire IT industry that we kind of knew where we were going. We were going to build networks that had millions of bits of sec as per second, even billions of bits per second. Rather than a million people on the internet, we were going to have billions of people. And rather than text, we were going to have audio and video, and it was going to be this amazing future. And from that time came this consensus that governments believed in, and they moved forward together. Well, that was possible because billions of dollars were on the line. Today, trillions of dollars are on the line. And so when governments go to talk to business about what digital policy should be, they get a lot of different answers. And worse than that, companies are spending hundreds of millions of dollars in fratricidal advertising to make their opponents look bad. Mm -hmm. So you talk all about the tech lash and how people are frustrated in the Internet. I, I don't have a good number. I'm a physicist, not a sociologist, but I think 80% of that is generated by companies who are trying to make tech companies look bad. And if you're a newspaper company and you're threatened by online content, you're going to spend money and lobby against these tech companies. So that's a two part question. How can governments really figure out what, in, uh, what, what industry needs? Not just the tech industry, but the, user, the users of tech. And, and do you think we're going to continue to see uh, the, this, these really nasty PR campaigns that uh, take even companies that are doing the right thing and paint them in the worst light? So uh, I, I believe that one part of the problem is that our political discourse is very much then in the U.S. shaped by lobbying and the access to decision making where that access is disproportionately uh, held by those who have the money to contribute mm -hmm. to campaigns. So there I would then, there's, there, there's definite lobbying in the EU. The, the U.S. tech companies, for instance, have invested tremendously in, in influencing the, the European Parliament, the European Commission, the member state capitals, but they have been less successful in doing so. And that is in part because the European lobbying process is also more open to the civil society and to different stakeholders. So I think that's one thing that explains why the relative power of the large tech companies to shape the debate in the EU is different to their ability to do so in the United States. I don't know, Mike, whether I would agree that 80% of uh, the, the concerns expressed about uh, digital economy and the conduct of these tech companies would be less than well-founded. I'm sure there are some companies that watch for their own interests. But I think we've been witnessing some genuine, really disconcerting aspects of the digital society. I don't think anybody can look at what happened, for instance, with, with the January 6th uh, insurrection of the Capitol that was fueled by disinformation campaign in the social media 
or they can look at the genocide taking place in Myanmar, where the, the Meta's uh, Facebook platform was basically seized uh, by Buddhist radicals and military to spread uh, uh, calls for ethnic cleansing in the country. So there's, there's many examples where I think we need to say that, look, there are serious problems with how these products and services that also serve our societies extremely well, yeah. that we really have that have provided just tremendous benefits to societies. But there are very serious problems that we always also need to address. I, I, I fully agree with you. It's just whether those, those bad stories get amplified. Well, we have covered about 10% of your book. Uh, there's a lot more to be found in those pages. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Anu, for being willing to take any question and, and providing very useful and concise answers. I hope everybody gets the book, either in hardback or online, and I hope this discussion continues. I know we're planning an in-person event in about a month and a half, and I look forward to seeing you here in Washington. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions that were posted in the chat, but... Um, I, I'm so glad we could do this and good luck with your with your book tour. I know you're going to be traveling and on lots of Zoom calls in the next uh, two months. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye bye. Okay.